get past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all the stealing. Are you desperate for some healing? Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way where there ain't no way, rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah, 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 amen, amen. Who can wipe away the tears for broken dreams and wasted years and tell the past to disappear? Oh, let me tell you about my Jesus and all the wrong turns that you would go and undo if you could. Work it all for your good. Oh, let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus, and let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah, 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 amen, amen, amen. Who would take my cross to Calvary, pay the price for all my guilty? Who would care that much about me? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Oh, he makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus changed your life. Hi, I'm Brian Leversee, pastor here at Fellowship Baptist Church in Vienna, West Virginia, and I want to invite you to join me and our church on a trip to the Holy Land. We're going to have a wonderful time exploring this ancient land full of biblical history and promise. You're going to be blown away as you step in the very areas that Jesus walked. We will be exploring locations where Jesus performed miracles, where stories from Scripture will come alive right where you're standing. Our travels will take us from the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, along cities and villages where Jesus and his disciples ministered, to being right out on the Sea of Galilee where Jesus walked on the water. Imagine seeing the hillsides where Jesus taught his Sermon on the Mount. Being able to take time to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane, observing communion right next to where Jesus paid the price for our sin and then was buried and three days later he rose from the dead. 
you won't want to miss this opportunity to be enriched in your faith and in your knowledge of the Word of God. You're going to experience extremely comfortable accommodations, wonderful food, and expert guides who are going to be able to really pull back the veil on the Israeli people and the history that accompanies the Jewish people. I'm working right now on developing the spiritual connections where we will come away with a deep and rich understanding of this land, its geography, and all the things that scripture tells us about it. Space is very limited, so make sure that you click the link below or go to our website at takemehome.church and sign up today. We would love to have you along with us. And this sound of this mighty rushing wind signified that God was moving among his people in a very specific way. The sound was as wind. Why is that important? Because this breath, this wind is also significant throughout scripture. We find that when God created, he breathed, he spoke, he said, let it be, and it was so. In God's creation of mankind, God formed man out of the dust of the ground and then breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Uh, We find that Jesus, when he met with his disciples, as he was explaining to them about the gospel kingdom, he breathed on them and said, receive the spirit. Now, I personally believe that that was a parenthetical. I don't believe that they received the indwelling spirit until here at Acts chapter number two, but I believe that was a parenthetical of Jesus administering out exactly how they would receive the spirit of God. How is it? Through his breath, through his life, through this rushing, mighty wind. And so we see that there was a room that was filled. This anointing that took place was an anointed filling, filling of time, filling of a room. But then it was also filling of people. People were filled here. Notice with me as we continue on in verse number three. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. What a blessing that is. I am so glad for the personal priesthood of the believer. Aren't you glad that if you're saved this morning, the Spirit of God doesn't just dwell in the time that we live, doesn't just dwell in the room that we live. Aren't you glad He dwells in you personally? He's filled you up. That's important for us to recognize. This is a personal relationship that we have with God where we are filled with the power and presence of His Spirit. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So there's a filling up of people. We see an anointed filling. Now I want to press on into learning some more in this passage. I want us to see also an anointed manifestation. We saw an anointed filling. Let's look at an anointed manifestation. God's power was manifested in, in very sensational ways in this passage of Scripture. And if we're not careful, we are so attracted to the sensationalism that that's what we want to duplicate. That's the problem. That's where a lot of false teaching and false doctrine comes to bear in Christianity is we don't honor the God who is miraculous. We honor the miracle. We want to duplicate the miracle. We want to duplicate the feeling feeling we get. We want to duplicate the sensation. We are sensual people. We are fleshly people. And many times, if we're not careful, we'll denigrate church into an experience of the flesh instead of exalting Christ and learning from him and letting him be the one that's in charge of our experiences. Letting him be the one that confirms his presence through the right kind of feelings and the right kind of actions and the right kinds of experiences. I'm not saying Christians shouldn't have experiences, but those experiences shouldn't be generated from our sinful flesh. Those experiences should be generated from the indwelling spirit of God as we are obedient to his word. And so we find here that there was a manifestation of the power and presence of the spirit of God. And I want us to see, first of all, it occurred in these tongues of fire that hung over the top of each of these individuals in this house. Notice with me again in verse number three, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. Wow! Aren't you glad when you read scripture, it lets us in on the fact that God is a miraculous God? How many of you believe that this morning? Shout amen. God's a miraculous God. 
He's supernatural. He's above us. He's beyond us. He's supernatural. And I believe this, and I know I'll probably get in trouble as a Baptist saying this, I still believe that God can do miraculous things amongst us. I look for it to happen. Now, I don't look for it because I look for the sensational or want to duplicate the sensational. But my God is no less powerful today than he ever was in the Old Testament or he ever was at the beginning of the church. Uh, He is the same God. Aren't you glad the Bible tells us this? He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We don't miss out on his power. We don't miss out on his presence. We don't miss out on his authority. We don't miss out on any of those things. We have all of that with us today. Now, certain manifestations of his power were used at certain times for certain purposes. And we'll unpack that as we go throughout our study. But I don't ever want us as a church to ever lose the sense of this fact. We have a supernatural, miraculous God. I still believe this. I believe God can heal whoever he wants to heal. And I believe he calls on us to pray for people to be healed. I still believe that God can make a way for someone overseas where I can't speak their language or know what's going on. I believe that God can make a miraculous way for them to hear the gospel. I'm not saying tongues are used in the same way as they were then or or used at that degree or any of those types of things. I'm just saying, how many of you know God can do whatever he wants to do? So when we start talking about his plan and purpose according to scripture, I don't want you to ever think I'm putting God in a box. He's sovereign. He's in control. He can do whatever he wants. But he is this. He's a God who will never lie. Aren't you glad he's honest with us? And he's true with us. And so he will not do things that he said he will not do. And he will not do them in ways he said he will not do them. So these are key truths. I'm just seeding into the back of your mind to think about as we discuss these things in the future, uh, moving through this particular book of Scripture. But we see an anointed manifestation. No doubt about it. This was supernatural. I don't think we're speaking in allegories here. I take the Bible literally until it emphatically says this is an allegory. I believe if you were in that room with these original disciples, you'd have looked around and you would have seen above their head cloven tongues of fire. Pastor, what did that look like? I have no idea. It's a word picture here. I don't know what it really looked like, but I believe it was a real, true manifestation of the miraculous God we serve. And you would have been in that room and you'd have seen it. But I think it's also important to to make the connection here because I think there's a very clear one. It should not be strange to us that God would represent his presence among his people with fire. He did this often throughout the Old Testament. You'll recall with me, if you will, that when Moses led the people of Israel out of Egypt, they were led by a pillar of fire at times, signifying the presence and direction and leadership of God over that nation. You'll find that when Moses finally was able to build the tabernacle, they built the Holy of Holies and the the significance presence, the signifier of the presence of God in the Holy of Holies was fire that hung over the location of the Holy of Holies. You'll find that when Solomon was able to finally dedicate the temple, that they performed a sacrifice and God allowed fire to fall from heaven and then it filled the Holy of Holies with the presence of God in the temple. This has been a very consistent signifier of the presence of the power of a miraculous God amongst his people. But now I want you to notice what's happening with the fire. It's over each individual. So where there was a tabernacle and where there was a temple, now we are the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in us. Somebody get excited about that this morning. The fire was signified in being seen over them. And we'll talk about this here in just a moment. But right after that, it says, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. So they saw the presence of God and then they were filled with the Spirit of God. So these cloven tongues of fire were a representation of God's Spirit now coming to indwell 
God's people personally. No more tabernacle. No more holy of holies we can't get to. No more temple. The veil is rent in two. And now, because of the indwelling power and presence of the Spirit of God, we can boldly go before the throne of grace where we can find His grace to help in time of need. So there's a significance here between, you know, this just wasn't sensationalism for sensationalism's sake. God's just not shooting off fireworks to entertain his people. And by the way, if you attend a church and are led by church leaders who constantly gravitate towards the sensational to try to entertain their people, you're running in a dangerous track because God never said that every day was going to be a David and Goliath moment. God never said that every day was going to be a Daniel in the lion's den moment. God never said that every day you're going to see miracle after miracle after miracle. And when you have to drum up the emotionalism by, by, by trying to manufacture all these miracles because you're chasing after the sensational, what you're really chasing after is your flesh. Listen, God does not need us to drum up his power. We're the ones who need his power in our life. That's why we sang and we prayed this morning, Revive us again. Get that fire stoked in our lives. So we see there was an anointed manifestation. The other thing I want us to notice about this fire that hung over their head is that it was a cloven tongue of fire. And I think this is so important for us to grab onto because it was really giving us an understanding of the purposeful action of this power. Jesus had told his disciples in Acts 1.8 that when you receive this power, you will be witnesses. How are we witnesses? By proclaiming his word. And so God was going to empower the tongues of men to be able to communicate his word with others. And here, one of the signs and signals of that was they were going to speak in languages that they did not know. We'll get into that here in just a moment. But we see an anointed manifestation. We see this fire these tongues of fire over their heads. But notice another manifestation here. It's these languages they're speaking. Verse number four. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. And tongues here simply means languages. The sense of it has been obstructed by a aberrant view of, of, of what's going on here in some Christian circles. Some people believe that this is a language that cannot be understood. It's an unintelligible language. It's just some kind of jargon or, or sounds that you make that are holy and, and have no real form or function to them. And that's not what's being spoken about specifically in this passage of scripture for sure. What's being spoken about are various languages. What, what the miracle was is God took Galileans who were expected to speak a certain way and caused their speech to be heard by all that were there in their own native tongue. That's what's going on here. How do you know that? Because it tells us that. How many of you know if you read all the Bible in context, it pretty much tells you what it's after. And, and notice what's happening here. Drop down with me to verse number seven. And they were all amazed. Why? Why? Well, they marveled. Why? Well, they said to one another, behold, are not these which speak Galilean? So they had an expectation. These are Galileans. They're going to sound a certain way. They're going to talk a certain way. What comes out of their mouth is going to be something that we would expect to come out of Galileans. But notice what happened. Verse number eight, and how hear we every man in our own tongue? Not some unintelligible tongue, not some gobbledygook. Notice the tongues that are represented here in verse number nine, Parthenians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia in Pontus in Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in some unintelligible language that only God knows. Is that what it says? We hear them speak in our tongue, our language, the wonderful works of God. So this was another manifestation of the power of God. And again, I like how it's tightly packaged with God's commission. It looks like a tongue because God's going to bless them to get the gospel out. It looks like a tongue because God is going to allow what they say to be heard in everybody's native speech. What a blessed, miraculous move of the Spirit of God. And then we see another anointed manifestation, and it's the message. See, it's always about the message. Let me say that again. It's always about the message. It's always about the message! 
What good is the miracle if it doesn't have a message? What good is the revelation if it doesn't point to anything? What good is it getting us all jazzed up if we've got nothing to get jazzed up about? And so it's about the, amen, it's about the message. And so what was the message? Well, notice what they were hearing in their own language at the end of verse number 12. I'm sorry, verse number 11. The wonderful works of God. The wonderful works of God. What are the wonderful works of God? Well, what is the good news? It's the gospel. They were now, as primarily Jews, starting to be able to put together the pieces of what the prophets had been telling them. And tongues were specifically used because the prophets foreordained that they would be happening. To confirm the word, to confirm the message. It's all about the message. For us, it's all about the packaging. Don't you love that about your kids? You buy them this wonderful Christmas present that you saved up for and you're excited to give them. And they open it up, throw it to the side and play with the box. (laughs) Build a fort. I would have just bought them cardboard every year if I knew. We get so enamored with the wrapping and the packages and the bows that a lot of times we miss out on the content the weightiness, the the heaviness of what God is doing. And that's always attached to his message. That's why uh, wherever you assemble to have church or or, or however you worship God, you want it to all point back to that central message. That's what's important. People might have different preferences about this or different preferences about that, but what you have to be able to do is you have to get back to who Jesus is. How many of you know it's all about Jesus? Jesus. And truth. So there's this anointed manifestation. Lastly, and we'll be done very soon, we see an anointed response. We've seen an anointed filling. We've seen an anointed manifestation. And we see an anointed response. I like this first response. Notice with me again, verse number seven. And they were all amazed and marveled. They were all amazed and marveled. How many understand God will do that to you? When you really get a, get, a, get a view of him, when you really understand who he is. When, I, I remember even as a, as a young child learning the word of God and memorizing scripture and having faithful teachers and my parents teach me the word of God and just marveling even as a youngster at who, who this God was, how he loved us and what he's done for us and how powerful he is in his creation and his intentions and desires for us. We should... We should, listen to me, we should never lose our amazement at who God is. We should never lose our amazement at who God is. It's anointed response. As they saw this manifestation of the power of God, they were amazed. They marveled. They said, who are these Galileans? Notice as we drop down to verse number 12, and they were all amazed and were in doubt. And that word doubt doesn't mean that they were in doubt concerning their faith. They were just overwhelmed with what they were experiencing. They were, they were overcome. Can this be happening? And their hearts were open to be inquisitive. Notice their response, what meaneth this? You know, it reminds me of the Philippian jailer who came to the Apostle Paul after he was in prison, and he said, what must I do to be saved? What meaneth this? It reminds me of the Ethiopian eunuch who Philip came up on as he was going home in his chariot, and he said, how will I know except some man show me? And here, when they see the demonstration of the power and presence of the Spirit of God, it prompts some to respond with a heart that's ready and prepared to say, what meaneth this? Tell me more. Responding to the truth. And this is intentional. God has anointed it. Jesus speaks about the grounds that exist, the the thorny ground and the stony ground and and the good ground. And when that seed falls on that good ground, oh, aren't you glad that one day your heart was good ground? That that seed of that gospel fell and it sprung up unto eternal life. It was an anointed response. But then notice this in verse number 13. Others mocked and said, these men are full of new wine. That's an anointed response as well. The Bible always accomplishes what God intends for it to accomplish. 
And, and I know it's a sad truth. I don't ever relish the idea that I'm speaking to somebody and their heart is hard into the gospel. It saddens me, but I know this. God's still working. And the, the, the response is anointed. The response of a good ground heart or the response of a hardened heart. What happened when Moses came to Pharaoh? And Moses was sharing with Pharaoh God's word and God's intentions. The Bible says that his heart was hardened. That's an anointed response. And sometimes we get upset with this world. I'm in this world. There's just no hope in it. And everybody's just evil. And we've got evil inclinations. And everything's going down the tubes. And yeah, all of that is true. But it's not a shock. We live in a sinful, broken world and we find ourselves getting distracted by the fact that some people don't respond. Don't be distracted by that. This is the hard truth. This is the hard truth. Listen to me. In Matthew chapter number seven, Jesus says this, broad is the way that leads to destruction and many there be that go in thereat. Narrow is the way that leads to life everlasting, and few there be that find it. And we see that playing out in our world. That should not dissuade us from preaching the truth. That should not dissuade us from being faithful concerning telling people about the wonderful works of God. How many of you believe this morning our wonderful God is worth talking about? Our wonderful God is worth being a witness of. Our wonderful God is why the Spirit gives us the power to proclaim Him. In Acts chapter number 2, we see an anointing, a christening of the church. How do we see it? Well, we see that there was an anointed filling, there was an anointed manifestation, and there was an anointed response. God is always the one that is in control. 